You ever see a molecule and think, what the fuck, it's so cute. That is oxidane for me. Just look at it. It's a little square with oxygen. So cute. Apparently oxidane is quite obscure, but that doesn't take away how cute and small it is. So that's enough reason to go and make it. So to get started, I set up my new stir plate and a large flask with a stir bar. I then add in 250 mils of DCM as the solvent. And as the base, I add in 183 mils of stinky fishy triethylamine. Now I will add in 100 grams of 3-chloro-1-propanol as the first reagent, which is the whole bottle. I wash the bottle a few times with DCM to get everything out and a lot of vapors form. I suspect there is some hydrogen chloride impurity in the reagent, which also reacts with triethylamine in the gas phase. I then set the flask in an ice bath and on top I add a dropping funnel. To this, I add 76 mL of acetyl chloride as the second reagent. I then add 200 mL of DCM in two portions to dissolve and dilute it. Now, I drop ice add the acetyl chloride to the flask while stirring it in the ice bath because the reaction is exothermic. In the reaction, acetyl chloride and 3 chloro one propanol react in the presence of triethylamine to form 3 chloro propyl acetate and the hydrochloric acid salt of triethylamine. In more detail, the alcohol group of 3 chloro one propanol is able to attack the carbonyl carbon of the acid chloride, where after an electron pair from the double bond moves onto the carbonyl oxygen, because the carbonyl carbon can only have four bonds. From the following intermediate molecule, the base triethylamine is easily able to take up a proton, of which the bond electrons move onto the oxygen to balance its charge. In the following molecule, the carbonyl double bond is able to reform and kicks off the chlorine, because it is a good leaving group. This chlorine ion can be taken up by the protonated triethylamine to form the salt triethylamine hydrochloride, which precipitates out of solution, and the molecule forms the final product, 3-chloropropyl acetate. The reaction can also progress without the base, but it improves the reaction rate and it doesn't release hydrochloric acid gas this way. During the reaction, we see it turns completely white from the precipitated salt, and we also see white vapors which is probably mostly from the reagents reacting in the gas phase. When the addition is complete, it has turned a bit yellow, and even pink. I then remove the ice bath, and leave it to stir strongly at room temperature for a few hours, to make sure the reaction is complete. When that is done, most of the pink has disappeared, and it is completely yellow. I then add a bunch of water to the flask, and stir it strongly, which will dissolve the precipitated triethylamine hydrochloride, and potentially destroy any remaining unreacted acetyl chloride. When that is done, we have two layers, with water and the dissolved salt on top, and the DCM with the product and some triethylamine on the bottom. I then move it all to a separatory funnel, and separate the layers. I discard the water layer, and then return the DCM layer to the separatory funnel. I wash it once with water, to be sure all the salt are taken out. I separate the layers again, and then return the DCM layer once more. We see that the DCM layer is cloudy, which often means that there is water present in the DCM. So to remove most of it, I wash it with brine which is a saturated solution of sodium chloride, which can pull water out of the DCM. We see the DCM layer becomes clear, and I separate the layers again. Now to the washed DCM layer, I add some anhydrous sodium sulfate to take up any water droplets that came through. I stir it strongly because the water droplets are floating on the surface of the DCM. We see the sodium sulfate sticks to the glass because it has taken up water. I then filter all of it through some cotton directly into a flask to remove the sodium sulfate and I wash the beaker and filter a few times with some fresh DCM. Now I set the filter up for short path vacuum distillation to first remove all of the DCM. Later on, when the DCM is gone, I increase the temperature and triethylamine starts distilling over. After a while, some of the product starts distilling over, so I swap the receiving flask again and start collecting it. I increase heat and pull a stronger vacuum and it all distills over easily. When all of it had come over, only some red liquid is left behind in the flask, which I discard. I also fractionally distilled the previous distillate to get out all of the product which got into it. And in the end, I am left with 116.88 grams of 3 chloropropyl acetate as a clear liquid, which is a yield of 81%. It's a little lower than literature, but it's still okay. And I will immediately use it for the next step. So I set up a three neck flask in a heating mantle and add in 144 grams of potassium hydroxide, which I heat to 140 C. I add 13 mL of water, so that it eventually becomes more of a mush. I add a regular fractional distillation setup with a Dimroth condenser to the middle neck, but it's too tall for me to film properly. I also add a dropping funnel to the right, 
and starboard the left neck. Then to the dropping funnel, I add in all of the 3 chloropropyl acetate I just made, and stopper it. When the potassium hydroxide has come to temperature, it becomes mushy, and I slowly run the 3 chloropropyl acetate onto it, and it immediately reacts to produce a bunch of vapors. In the reaction, 3 chloropropyl acetate reacts with 2 equivalents of potassium hydroxide to produce oxetane, potassium chloride, potassium acetate, and water. This reaction, like many, does not only yield the product, in this case oxetane, but also produces aloe alcohol as the main side product. In more detail, the hydroxide from potassium hydroxide can attack and add to the carbonyl carbon of the ester, which causes an electron pair from the double bond to move onto the carbonyl oxygen. When the electron pair reforms to a double bond, it causes the ester bond to attack the electron deficient carbon to which the chlorine is attached to. This forms oxetane and kicks off the chlorine ion which is taken up by the remaining potassium ion to form potassium chloride. At the same time, another hydroxide can take up the proton from what would be acetic acid, but immediately forms potassium acetate and water instead, in these very basic conditions. This is what happens in the formation of oxetane, but a second mechanism to form allyl alcohol can also take place in these conditions. In that case, the hydroxide ion is able to take up a proton from the middle carbon, causing the bond electrons of the hydrogen to form a double bond which moves the bond electrons of the chlorine onto the chlorine atom and kicks it off, which can form potassium chloride with the remaining potassium ion. We are then left with allyl acetate as the product. This can then undergo base catalyzed hydrolysis by attack of the hydroxide ion onto the carbonyl carbon. It does the same as in the previous mechanism, but instead the ester bond electrons move onto the ester oxygen, which then takes up a proton from water to produce allyl alcohol and regenerate potassium hydroxide. And again, potassium acetate and water like before. During the reaction, oxetane along with some side products slowly start distilling over. We see a lot of vapors form in the reaction flask, and after a while, the addition is finished, and I let it distill until nothing more comes over. In the end, only some mush of potassium hydroxide, acetate, and water with some other junk is left. Now, the distillate still contains some allyl alcohol and other impurities because the reaction temperature was quite high. So to separate it from the oxetane, I add in 10 grams of potassium hydroxide and set it up for fractional distillation. The boiling point of oxetane is only 49C, while allyl alcohol has a boiling point of 97C, and other impurities have an even higher boiling point, so they can be easily separated. On top, I have added a short path distillation apparatus, and we see the vapors slowly climb through the fractionating column. I insulate it with aluminum foil, to make sure it all comes through, and oxetane is slowly collecting in the receiving flask. When it stops coming over, all that is left in the flask is an orange liquid, so I stop the distillation. In the end, I am left with 16.7 grams of oxetane, which is a yield of 34%, and is pretty close to the literature. So now that I finally have this cute molecule, I will give it a worthy place to rest. So I set up a storage bottle and pour in all of the oxetane. I close the bottle, and give it a nice label to match its cuteness. And also, I will take a small sample to see if it ignites cutely. Okay, that was a pretty cute flame. That was it, thanks for watching, and as always, a special thanks to all my patrons. See ya!